Um, firstly, apologies to Pascal for appearing late today. Um, this is probably the furthest up north I've been in maybe 10, 15 years. Um, and, uh, me performing after Pascal is a bit like you having a sirloin steak and then me giving you a rocket salad afterwards. <laughs> I will try and do my best, nonetheless. Um, I'm going to be reading from my latest book, Terrible, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But um, I'll start with the first poem, Human Beauty. The first thing you taste is the sweat and bleach of human delivery. The story of life is always the thing and something to wash away its stain. Each year a step you tumble down, falling apart a little more. How time drags you by the ankles so slowly. Through the grass you watch it all pass. The expectant faces of the people you love slipping into the dark. You clutch at weeds but nothing will grip. And in the end, like us all, you fall into the cold black earth, every window in the world slams shut. A lot of my work um, is confessional, and um, when I was growing up, I was born in 1986, so I was growing up in the early 90s, and now it's not that rare, but I was one of the, the few children who at the, the school gates, my parents, were basically my dad, I didn't have a mother there with him, I was brought up by my dad, who was a single parent. Um, and so I wanted to write this poem, which is about our relationship um, as I became an adult and also our relationship to the outside world as it changed. This is 1991 to 2006. My father's pounded blue Ford and my feet barely glancing the receipts and marble cartons piled on the floor. The strips of paintwork peeling empty promises from neon signs. The city's yellow horizon, a pair of hands, composing the softly lit dreams of businessmen in hotel rooms, screwing silk ties in their worn palms, their heads full of yes, each night a heave dice, and we're driving further through it each year. My toes starting to plant the mat, your hair graying in the rearview mirror, the faces from our life passing like boarded up doors. One of the um, few great things about being an amputee, apart from discount on socks, um, <laughs> is that you get asked, you can guarantee you'll get asked at least once a week by someone, usually a stranger, how you lost your leg. And you get to be very creative with your answers. <laughs> depending on how well you know them, how drunk you are, etc, etc. Um, and crocodiles and kittens have come up before, I think, in the past. But um, like a lot of these things, the real answer is, is kind of a lot more boring. It's, um, I had bone cancer when I was 11, um, and I didn't respond to chemotherapy. And so basically the amputation saved my life. Um, and since then I've been cancer free for the last kind of 18, 19 years now. Um, and this next poem is about being kind of 12, 13, going through puberty and not only having that kind of um, fear of being able to find your place in the world, but at the same time being an amputee and not seeing anyone else who looked like you, kind of having a normal life. This is Ouija. For as long as I remember, I never wanted what I had. The half-read books cluttered in piles, the guitar strings ruined to dust. I've always been dirty, tobacco wedged under nails, the shock of snowflakes shook from scalp to shoulders. I'd never seen someone like me stride from paychecks to a wedding. I slept in abandoned rooms at school. Nothing in this world was worth waking for. So I tried to pray than others. The tarot with its sharp answers and shots in the dark. The off-cutting woodwork I painted with the alphabet. The glass hovered in my hands. I knocked and no one answered. I was alone. I'd have taken a broken ghost or a death scream reeled over and over again. In fits of tears of blood, I wanted something to need to love me. To love to need me as I am. 
Has um, anybody here heard of Phantom Pains? Yeah, yeah most of you. So, um, we still don't know exactly how it works, but um, in our brain we kind of have a blueprint of how our body is, and if that doesn't match up with how your body physically kind of presents itself, then you could have this pain, this spasm, and it can be very disabling just by itself for some people. Um, but I thought there was something very beautiful in it. Um, for me personally, it was a kind of reminder every time I have it of what I've lost and also what I've gained. Because um, without, without it, I wouldn't be here. This is Phantom. The bargain was met when my leg hit the fire. The tumour cracked like glass, its only desire to fill like love burned. The hairless skin of my femur whittled back to the bone. The weights reset, blanked over. This was the price for life, glittering with laughter in the sheets beside you. But at night, when we've drawn the day's work from the curtains and set the plates back in the drawer, this phantom clutches my hip and hauls me to the floor. The stump as tense as the hornet's nest we bagged from the roof. The tremor in our hands, not anger, but desperation to live. Like the satchel of sparks, my scar pulls tight. The bone rotted to carbon and spilt in a stream, sucked by the weeds to grow. Just as my spine has strained, the left side tautening into a ridge of muscle over the cleft, Preparing for the return in this life or next to pull the tendons tight. Find the angle where the socket latches to clamp and slip back over the leg. The doctor's dams with swathes of iodine and sores. I'm doing a PhD next year at um, Birmingham City University. Um, and I'm hoping to look into a bit more of uh, disability as a social aspect. Um, and one of the things I wanted to explore is relationships. Because um, I've been in relationships with disabled people and able-bodied people. And um, when one person is disabled and the other is able-bodied, there is a certain kind of fear and a certain kind of tension that hasn't really been explored yet, but I want to look into. Um, a lot of ideas about whether who we are is what we can do, whether that defines us, whether it's purely performative, whether you are what you can do, and therefore, if you are what you can't do, what kind of a failure that can make you feel as a disabled person. So uh, this poem is about that. This is Doppelganger. Eyes waltzed behind morphine in the bath and braced for the flood from the watering can. You pour with a delicacy that makes me weep. Holding my flaccidness in my hands, the boiler beyond repair, I wash my hair and you ask if it needs the hot dash to free my locked joints. How my doppelganger drags our lives beyond the poverty line once again, hissing in your ear, how fucking pathetic. And you'll say you can't bear this weight in a week. You'd rather be alone than with this crumpled mess of apologies and mistakes that shakes in the corner of the bedroom. A towel over my shoulders, that once tensed over your pupils bloom. I'll keep this lightning trapped in my hip, my strange weather. The dent I sank into will rise from the sofa in a mist of cologne and possibilities. The limits of our bodies and what they represent is, is something I'm continually trying to fight with at the moment whilst I'm doing this PhD. Um, Certainly a lot of the women in the room will be able to identify the fact that um, everywhere you turn, marketing and advertisements tells you to be a certain person, have a certain type of body, have a certain type of presence, and if you don't do that, you're not part of the club, you're not a woman. Um, and on a subtle kind of genderless level, there is that with disability as well. If you don't have a certain level of able-bodiedness, then you are not kind of part of the normal you are ever. Um, and there are a few escapes from that in this book. I'm going to read a couple of them now. The first one is Where We Go, and this is based on astral projection. It's not that we want to leave our lives, just our bodies for the night. 
the childhood promises that refuse to be honoured, the parts of us that weep in bad weather. We unfasten our skin at the seams, it buckles as our sighs bleed out the bright room and we drift like balloons to the cracked ceiling, far enough to feel the bundle of nerves slip from the flash. And we never go anywhere but through the open window, past the silver threads of rain, to the simple cranium of street lights outside. We enter neither animal or neighbour, but the same glass boxes, to want nothing of desire or love, just the indivisible blink of wire in glass. And another type of escape. This is the one that closes all doors. When you see the knife, it's a slow bloom of clarity, how the blade sharpens towards a point that unwraps each problem set before it. The heel wedging perfectly between the gap of the cupboards and the kitchen. If the balance skewed, it would slide through the dull lung. You'd feel each error nicked in the steel as they inched it out and stitched you up with the bite of a needle. But you're certain this is the one that will carve the heart clean as fruit, that will slip out like paper from an envelope. You leave the letter folded perfectly in half, take three strides back and prepare yourself to run. A lot of this book is about um, self-perception to some extent. And um, nowadays we have a part of our lives which is very self-centered and aesthetic and self-absorbed um, in terms of selfies. And that's something I wanted to look into as well. Um, instead of a self-portrait, a selfie shows who we are meant to really be, but when we look at it, we see things that other people don't. And uh, so I wanted to write something that was what I saw when I see a picture of me. This is selfie. I can't escape these lips, or the impression they leave on napkins, thighs, the areolas that swell between their grip. These sharp blue eyes snap lives like pines in storm-dragged gales, fingers stained with all the makeup spoiled before them, the smile jerked from the corner of my lip like a tooth strung to a door, yanked when the shutter tightens over me as my family did when they tore the tumour from the bone. This picture is a warning. This is the wrong turn, the darkest cocktail chalked on the wall, the smell of stale aftershave in the cab ride home. My mistakes are bleached dry by the flash. The photo only exists when seen, and what I am slips away when you turn the page. I'm going to read two more poems now. Um, a lot of the writers in here will know that when you're doing a book, you don't really know what it's about yet until you get to a certain point, and that can be quite late on. Um, and uh, I didn't know what this book was about until I, I wrote the title poem. Um, and the things I've been through, the trauma um, in terms of the cancer and, and such, has left, left me with uh, what what I guess we call um, survivor syndrome, which some cancer survivors get, which is kind of a guilty feeling of why, why me, why did I survive, why didn't anyone else? You know, because when you grow up on a ward, you see a lot of other friends who, who pass. Um, and I've kind of subconsciously through my life um, created a kind of personal mythology around that, of the reasons why things don't go my way or the reasons why um, things turn bad, and that's called the terrible. And that is this poem. When I was 11, I prayed so hard for the cancer that would deliver my mother's love. My fingers had to be prized apart like scallop shells. The cells tumbled through my blood. God would never answer me again. At 19, my girlfriend poured a circle of salt around our bed. We spooned in greasy sheets and stared through the window as the rain sewed rooftops into one impenetrable dream. But she'd passed the right the wrong way, 
something terrible whispered in her ear at night. At 21, I slid my tongue inside a saint whose hair burned redder with each cigarette she lit. Like loose chains, she tried to shake the terrible from me until the bed glittered like the sea, each breath dragging us deeper. Today, Emily fills my eyes in our grubby basement flat. Each time I tell her I love her, my heart crushes like a paper cup. The diamond winces on her hand, its brightness weighing us down in shadow. And before I do the final poem, I'm a big thank you to the people at Poets and Players and to Pascal um, and to people like Janet, I know Edmund and Chris and people backstage who've kind of organised this today. And thank you to everyone for coming. Um, there are books for sale and if you just want to have a chat afterwards, that would be great as well. Um, I'm going to end on a poem which means a lot to me. Um, myself and my wife are both disabled and the last kind of two years has meant that um, the pain and the side effects of pills has kind of put very narrow boundaries on what our daily life is. And I wanted to write a positive poem about disability and love, about the, the positive elements that are there. And uh, this is that poem. Thank you very much, so much again. And this is love. She goes limp and falls into my arms like an important looking letter. I help her to the bathroom and sit the other side of the door tearing nails between my teeth, clutching the phone like a safety rope. And this is love, how we live between the side effects of glittering pills, the wads of her dead hair snarled in the plug hole, the morning cigarette that shakes in her hand before her kiss once again says, whatever happens. I ring the ambulance when her head smacks the floor, and in the crazed flutter of her lids, I see a million lives for us, each one perfect. Thank you, Edison.